You, you are now welcome. listening to the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professional professionals. So you can learn, lift, and live with your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mehdi. I graduated from AUK 2009. I minored in psychology and took all of your classes. And yeah, ever since then, I basically got so much interested in psychology and I, I actually wanted to go back and major in psychology. Of course, being a psychologist for such a long time, I could see like when people come to therapy and they evolve a lot once they get to learn more about themselves, they become isolated from the general public. It can affect our personality, especially if we're repressing it. And that's what we should not do. We should not repress our emotions after a traumatic experience because when that happens, you're not solving the problem. When that happens, you're actually changing and manipulating your personality into something way worse than could have been if you let out all these emotions. All this and more in today's episode. Hey, welcome. Matt, you're going to tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I have a lot of these questions about this new stage of your life. Of course, uh, just like Mahdi, Ahmed and Mahdi, they both go back to being my students. I love the way we've added these students that are intelligent and they do things after AUK and develop something out of them. But I'm very, very interested in the route, in the journey you took since 2009. So tell us. I graduated from AUK 2009. I minored in psychology and took all of your classes and yeah ever since then i basically got so much interested in psychology and i i actually wanted to go back and major in psychology but i found myself writing instead you know and, and uh, reflecting more looking deeper into myself i try to understand people around me years i've learned a lot of human behavior and things that you know you can't really it wasn't like one specific thing but so you wanted to really get up Get a PhD in psychology? Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, definitely something I wanted to do. But I guess life happened, you know, and one thing came after the other. Mm. Priorities changed, but psychology was always like deeply rooted in, into my interests. Now, after you graduate, did you go, because now you're in Qatar, did you travel there right away? You got a job there or what happened before you wrote I, your I worked in AUK for five years before I moved to Qatar. and. After moving here, I experienced several life-changing encounters that led me into writing. And I always liked writing, like it was always a passion, but never really materialized until I found myself in complete isolation. And it's interesting actually, because now we are in some kind of forced isolation, which brings back a lot of this passion again. But this is one point I would like to discuss today, actually, the, the, the whole concept of isolation and what it brings out of me. It mm. actually brings the best out of us. This is like a deja vu for me because that's when I start, you know, writing and experimenting with myself and observing behaviors of people and the general population. It's quite interesting. So this happened real fast, dude. Usually I get a heads up and try and read the books that you know people come on and they write. But this interview happened so fast. What's the book about? Okay, so. The book is, it covers a lot of topics. And uh, what triggered me to write the book to begin with was an encounter, you know, I had with this person that made me realize what kind of person I am. You get to meet a lot of people in the course of your life, but there are specific people that make you like reevaluate everything. And, and it's like looking at yourself in the mirror and realizing the kind of person you really are, you know, including your shadows and your shadow self and, and all that. Sometimes it's just in a blind spot, but it surfaces when you meet someone that is kind of similar to you. So that exactly what happened. You know, I met that person and uh, things didn't work out. And I realized that I have a lot of things to work on myself. I basically realized that I'm a narcissist. And this is something I a lot of people don't realize, like, you know, narcissist doctor, it's, it's very hard for a narcissist to admit they're narcissist or even realize they're narcissists. And it's something that requires a lot of self-awareness and self-reflection and self-evaluation to reach that level. And when I reached that stage, I decided to isolate myself from 
everything from all the people I know and start to reflect, you know, write down the kind of person I am by looking at myself in the mirror and just words took me from there. But it's not just about that. You know, it's, uh, that was just the beginning. That was just the start point. What happened was I kept going through a lot of self-reflection and one thing led to another. And then I realized that I'm at a point where I'm questioning existence, the whole of existence. You know, who am I? What am I? What are we here for? What is religion? What is God? You know, what is life and what's the purpose what's the true purpose and you start questioning the purpose of existence and sometimes it takes you to a dark place but it's necessary for you to go to this dark place in order to find this light at the end of the tunnel so it's been a harrowing experience actually it was very hard for me but i came out with lots of conclusions lots of different conclusions and these conclusions materialized into the book I wrote. What kind of things did this person say that, uh, so before this person told you you're a narcissist, or at least uh, you never really realized you were. And like you said, a lot of narcissists don't really believe that they are. And a lot of them don't even go to treatment because they think that what they're doing is, you know, they're very self-focused. So it's hard to really understand and be empathic with other people. Dr. D, so what did, kind you of call, did you tell Ahmed he was a narcissist back in the day? <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I had to throw that one out there. <laughs> I, don't think, I think I like right Ahmed now. and I like... I, no, I like... I mean, for me, professors, maybe we don't see it because narcissism, you really see a lot more in the intimate relationships. Exactly. Or with, so for me, it's like I was a professor, so there must be a lot of narcissists, unless they've had like a, an encounter with me of something. And I know, but Ahmed was always analytical. He always questioned things. Maybe he came up cocky sometimes, but I don't really think that I would have recognized he was narcissist. But it's just like Ahmed, a lot of people, they get into these relationships and then they realize that maybe they are. So what kind of characteristics were you showing at that time? that made you realize, well, maybe this person, because, you know, a narcissist, you can tell them they're narcissists and they're like, they create their own belief. They have their own perception, imagination of what really happened just to protect their ego, as, you know, mm -hmm. Freud would say. Yeah, it's all about the ego. And like you said, it's very hard to realize if a person is a narcissist unless you get into an intimate relationship with them, right? Otherwise, it's really hard to notice these traits until you get really close to that person. For me, it was almost impossible to realize that I am one myself until I met one. And the more you interact with a person on an intimate level that is more or less like you, you get to read more about that person and then realize that you're reading about yourself. You're not really reading about that person only, but you're also reading about yourself. And that was the moment of realization for me. It was like, that was like a description of, of who I was. And uh, that's when I realized I have to do something about it, you know. I guess it would be nice to come back later because, you know, a lot of narcissists don't do well in treatment. So it would be nice to see what you've done. But, but so this journey has, so it really took you, because your book is really existential. It talks about the ego. It talks about perception, imagination. It talks about questioning your life. It's very deep. Also, it's very deep. Like the first time, long time ago, maybe two years ago, I got it. I started reading about it and I was like, wow, Ahmed is getting really deep. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times you don't think like, you know, your book is very deep and it's because it has a lot to do on self-reflection and humanity, I guess. Mm -hmm. for, for me, what I personally realized in this journey was it's basically a spectrum that the ego, there's a spectrum where at one end you have the ego and on the other end you have the oneness of nature and, and the universe and, you know, the, the whole aspect of everyone is the same. Everyone is, we're not different from each other. It's, it's only the ego that separates us from each other and, and um, gives us this sense of pride, you know, that I'm different. I'm not the same as the others. I'm better than those around me, you know, in one way or another, whether it is correlated to culture, ideologies, behavior, you know, all this is just noise, you know, and, and um, once you realize that, the closer you get to the realization that we're all one. And uh, when that happens, you do experience something called ego death. And once you put yourself in that field, this vibrational field, you get to attract more stuff and more people and magic happens when, when you get there. You know, it's, uh, you get to move away from your egoistic 
itself and you realize where things went wrong, you know, and, and that was very powerful to me. It was very profound. Very deep. I have, did you, since you were really questioning existence and, you know, whenever we have people that are questioning existence or existential and they start questioning God or questioning, why am I here? Am I really here? Am I not here? You know, all these, they're also philosophical. Did you get a lot of resistance? When you wrote this book or when you were going to by family, friends, did they feel like you're becoming non-believer? Like, yeah, a lot of people thought that I, I'm taking a very dangerous route. A lot of people resisted. A lot of people told me that, you know, whatever you're doing is not good. It's not right. But that's why I had to isolate myself because when you write, you're never going to satisfy everyone, right? That's mm -hmm. never going to happen yet. You're never going to satisfy everyone. So it's critical, regardless of what you're writing about, mm. it's critical that you completely isolate yourself from everyone and, and try not to talk about what you're writing until it's actually published. That's actually what I did. No one knew what I was writing about until it was actually published. I gave some kind of idea to those around me, those close to me, what I was writing about, but no one thought that, you know, I would become published. So for them, it was just like a hobby. But when it actually materialized, that's, that's when a lot of feedback started to trickle in and a lot of resistance and a lot of criticism, a lot of praise, a lot of followers. It's quite interesting how things fell into place. But as for myself, I saw clearly now, like I saw clearly throughout the whole process, it was just me seeing clearly, you know, and, and um, this is something you can never explain to the person, you know, what you're going through, what you've been through is not something that one would understand until they actually go through the experience themselves. I'm going to jump on in terms of your Instagram account. One of the images that really kind of captured me was the image you have about narcissism of the guy holding the mirror, looking into his face. Who does your artwork? I mean, do you do the artwork or do you have someone that picks these pictures for you? I mean, some of it's pretty cool, man. Like, I, I got to give it that. I'm trying to change things on a little bit of a lighter note here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for the artwork, a lot of the photos and pictures are actually taken by me. Some of the artwork are shared by friends, you know, and, and all of the artwork are done through, they're edited through Photoshop. I basically Photoshop them. But some of the pictures are primary pictures basically taken by me. Some are sent by friends. Some are just paintings, you know, some are simply photos shared by people, you know, and I just edit them and Photoshop them and then post them. So do you have like a specific attachment to the uh, the post when you do post them? Like this one that I'm looking at is the, the one, the guy holding the mirror. Yeah. The guy holding the mirror with narcissism. Do you have a special attachment to some of these? Yeah, I, I don't know if that sounds like a stupid question, but I'm just curious. No, it's not. Yeah, it's uh, it's not. I actually relate to that picture a lot. And sometimes we prisoners of our own beliefs and we don't really see beyond what we know, our boundary of knowledge, right? And our boundary of knowledge, the accumulation of what we've learned throughout our lives is all we know. And that puts us in a cage. And the only way to understand others and uh, coexists with others without having to go through quarrels and fights and all that is to look into yourself because when you look into yourself that's where you realize that you're just in a cage and it's um something that it's very hard like it's really really hard to be able to twist that mirror and look deeper into yourself because what you will see is the darker side of yourself and, and nobody wants to see that you know Everyone wants to believe that, you know, they're good people. Everyone believes that they're good people deep inside, right? But that's not the case. We all have our good and bad side. And uh, confronting your bad shadow self is, is not easy. But once you do that, you actually get rid of your ego slowly. And uh, you start realizing that no one is right. There is no ultimate truth. Everyone is living their own truth. It's just like, you know, the stars in the universe every star is dispersed in its own direction like where is the right direction what is the right thing to do i don't think there is one right thing to do or one truth per se but everyone is living their own truth and everyone is believing that they are right right where is the one whole truth who is right 
that's that's a question everyone should ask themselves. You remind me of a lot of these concepts we studied uh, or I teach in psychology and social psychology that you guys have taken to the sense of like perception or in which lens are you looking at? Is it your lens? Is it someone else's lens? Can two people see the same thing and have two different experiences of it? Which goes back to what you're saying. It has a lot to do with your self-reflection, how much you know yourself and, and the experiences and your age. And all of that plays a part about perception, but everyone has their own perception. And it's people really have a hard time understanding it because everyone wants to be right. And everyone goes out trying to prove a point that what I'm feeling is right, what you're feeling is wrong. So, And actually, your book does touch on on a lot of precepts like expectations, you know, the sense of what are we expecting from other people. It talks about aggression, imagination, you know, things like we touch a lot on. Actually, it's a lot of it is more social psychology, although you do say a lot about the ego, which goes back to it. But I'm really interested in why did you name it Beyond the Prison of Belief? Because we're all imprisoned by our own beliefs. That's the problem. And uh, we're all grew up basically believing that what we acquired by our culture or by our parents or family or by our traditions, that's what's right. That's what we should believe in. And that's what we should preach and try to convince people that this is the one right thing you should follow as well. But what you realize that every single person, even within the same culture and within the same religion and within the same traditions and nations, every single person is different completely different and and, um, trying to cage yourself in a box is just going to cause more pain than liberation and it's really important to understand and realize that every single person is different and knowing how to coexist with that person regardless of what they believe in otherwise we'll always find ourselves in fights in wars and crimes and all these things you know it's when you don't really understand the other that's what we fear the most you know the fear of the other yeah but when we look the deeper we look into ourselves the more we are realize that at the core we're just all the same mm-hmm. we're literally all the same how would you describe your experiences of living in kuwait versus living now in qatar in terms of you know how we're you know how you're describing it right now would you say it's been the same life experiences or has living in Qatar sort of broadened your horizon a little bit, especially when it came to writing the book? That's a really good question, Mahdi. And I'm always grateful for my experience in, in Kuwait. And maybe I grew more in Qatar, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, Qatar is better than Kuwait, right? It, it, it just happened that a more advanced stage in my life that attracted certain experiences that made me grow faster and grow more than how I did in Kuwait. I was um, a bit younger. But also in Qatar, I noticed that it's way more diverse and and that definitely helped a lot. You get to meet a lot of people from different walks of life and you get to realize that there's a lot more than what we know or what we grew up to believe. And that kind of exposure is definitely more in Qatar in terms of diversity. Of course, being a psychologist for such a long time, I could see like when people come to therapy and they evolve a lot once they get to learn more about themselves and, you know, the deeper they go into understanding who they are and understanding what they are and their experiences in life, the more they become isolated from the general public. Like somehow people that do, like I remember when I was in graduate school, we had to do psychoanalysis because in my program, we have to do psychoanalysis because we are truly believed that psychologists should really work on their, I mean, we're psychologists because we have our own shit, excuse my language. So don't believe any psychologist or psychiatrist that says I went to the field because I love human behavior. It's also because we want to understand ourselves. I remember my professor saying, psychoanalysis is going to be able to get you to become more deeper internally where you can understand yourself and understand your triggers because of course we have to work on the counter transference transference you know understanding but the point it was is that i remember when i went to my psychoanalyst i felt like he was very deep of course they are but also i felt like it reshaped me in some way where i started to like question a lot of things which then changed some of my 
relationship with other people. I became, I don't know if they've become, if they saw me more deeper. I started looking at them differently. I felt like it did change. Of course, I couldn't stay long because I was a student and psychoanalysis cost a lot in Chicago. And they wanted us to do it two or three times a week. Of course, those that can afford. And then I decided to go to CBT. It was easier. But I remember this few experiences I had. It had really made me, I don't want to say serious. It just made me become more isolative. I don't know how to describe it. Did mm. you feel the same way? Absolutely. With soul searching? Has your behavior changed with other people? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to your point about Psychotherapy. I wanted to ask you, actually, I've, I've never asked you this question. Uh, are you a Freudian or a Carl Jung kind of school of thought? Because they, they both have like different ideologies when it comes to personality theory. Well, I mean, I've, I went to a school that was very eclectic, so you could learn a lot. At first, we learned psychoanalysis. I liked it. But right now, I use more CBT because it's easier for the certain issues that we manage here. Sometimes psychoanalysis takes longer and a lot of times people, of course, psychoanalysis is updated and you could do things, but no matter what, whoever it is, I still work with them a little on their childhood and then the, the roots of where they are, how they've developed. And then I um, use psych CBT. But here, most of the cases we see uh, anxiety, panic uh, disorders or depression, Some most of the time they'll need here, people are not comfortable to you know, go back to their childhood or yeah, what happened. Yeah, but I do use it a lot. I think this childhood analysis is very important. Mm -hmm. But but I think it does change people, you know? It sounds like you've been impacted by Sigmund Freud a lot, doctor. I have, I have. Not you <laughs> Yes, exactly. Not <laughs> Yeah, it's but, like more professors, you know, they were all psychoanalysts, Freudian, you know. So do you feel like it has changed your relationship with other people? Have you lost some of your friends? Do they see you as deep and weird? Absolutely. You... Absolutely. Like a lot of people uh, think I'm taking life too seriously now. And uh, def definitely a lot of people has dropped out of my life, you know, and, and just naturally fell off, you know, and, and I did lose a lot of people through through this process. Only those really close to me stayed in touch and understood what I'm going through. But it, it was definitely a cleansing period. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, actually, because the way I look at it, in order for you to find your new self, it's through the process of elimination. And through the process of elimination, you can only find your purpose through the process of elimination. And by that, I mean you need to eliminate everything that is holding you back as a human being, as, as a person. Everything that is holding you back, whether it's certain places that you, you go to or, you know, mind altering substances, you know, negative patterns or people, anything that is holding you back, if you just eliminate it out of your life and you find yourself in this state of isolation, you'll naturally start attracting what actually moves you forward and uh, betters you as a human being. That naturally happens when you just eliminate all the things that were holding you back. But it's hard to do that because a lot of people, they get really comfortable with the routine. You know, the people they know, whether they're good or bad for them, they just feel like they're in this vicious circle where they need to see the exact same people. They need to go to the exact same places and uh, they can't detach from that. They can't cut the loop and uh, isolate themselves. It's a really hard job. So would you group isolation more in the self-care aspect when it comes to that? I mean, it seems like you, you've really taken care of yourself over the years. And do you think that's a major factor? I mean, given that there's narcissism and that's, you know, overdoing it with miring yourself, so to speak. But do you still practice self-care at the same time? I hope that question makes sense, by the way. It made sense yeah. in my head. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I'm hoping that makes sense. It does, Mahdi. And uh, yes, I do practice self-care, actually. And this is through new practices that I, and new routines that I basically seeked after this isolation phase. You just find yourself doing nothing, right? And you're like in an existential crisis, you know, it's like, what am I supposed to do with my life now? And uh, this is where you start to unlearn what you knew about yourself and about life in general. And you start adopting these new habits, you know, benefit to you, including, you know, reading, whatever it is, you know, reading, painting, just meditating, relaxing, and all these things do help. And they do attract things, a lot of things and a lot of people a lot of different people to you. In that sense, it attracted a lot of people that directed me in certain directions 
that advised me to do certain things. And one thing led to another until I came across, you know, this retreat in Peru. I don't know if you guys have heard about it or not, or have you heard of ayahuasca? Yes. Before? Uh, yeah, I've heard of ayahuasca. I've definitely heard of ayahuasca. <laughs> did, you, did you try it? How was that experience? I, yeah, th- <laughs> I that, have it. It's a hallucinogenic. Uh, basically, it's real oh. big right now in California. That, and- yeah, that was the cherry on top for me, actually, Mahdi. And this is something I would love to discover on, like in terms of psychology, Dr. D, and it's uh, something really interesting. Obviously, it's not really considered a hallucinogenic in Peru. It's, it's actually uh, legal in Peru, and it's done in a medically licensed center. And uh, the people there, they don't believe in um, man-made pills or pharmaceuticals or all these you know, medicines, man-made medicines that can treat someone psychologically or physically, they just do their own thing. And and I personally became a believer of that after going and experiencing it myself. I was like, you know, we really need to discover this world because it's just buried in South America for some reason. And a lot of people want it this way because this would mean uh, the downfall for a lot of um, pharmaceuticals and alcohol companies and all the mind-altering substances and and investments put into industries will completely change once you try ayahuasca. Just to make it clear, he was doing this under medical supervision, okay? This was not done at Burning Man. I'm sure you've heard of Burning Man where people go, they build like these really big things and then they burn it Yeah, I've heard that. And, you know, they trip out on LSD and ayahuasca and all this stuff. Like it's really, it's starting to get really trendy in Silicon Valley. And that's one thing I wanted to ask you. Was it trendy when you went to Peru? Like, was it a trendy thing where the trendsetters there or was it people that are just going to find themselves? Because me and Dr. D have talked about this on the show before that right now they're using LSD to treat people with PTSD from, you know, from the Gulf War. And it's minimal dosages under supervision of care, you know, physicians. So it's something that's being practiced and you see it a lot with uh, some of the hallucinogenic drugs, but in very minimal quantities. So how was it there? I mean, I'm sure they didn't give you like 100 milligrams and say, here you go, trip your brain out. So how did they administer it to you guys? I'm really curious about that. Okay, so first of all, you need to understand that this is a medically licensed center with lots of physicians, psychologists, nurses, shamans, and a lot of people that have been doing this for hundreds of years. It's actually a tradition in South America that has been passed on to generations. And, it's and, like peyote. Uh, it's like peyote for the American Indians. They used to, exactly. go, on, they used to exactly. go on their, you know, their retreats and stuff. Exactly. It's actually considered as a spiritual retreat. And it's uh, definitely not considered as uh, a hallucinogenic or LSD because LSD is actually man-made and with ayahuasca, it's different. It's a plant. They call it a plant medicine and they have like, it's very revered there. There is so much respect for the plant there and they take it very seriously and it's very well administered. The interesting part here is that I met a lot of people with a lot of different traumas, you know, and, and psychological disorders. And the way they were after that retreat was just mind blowing guys like it was as if they were a new person like we had a person that was really depressed like in a an extreme state of depression and that was her last resort before she committed suicide which she tried before but that was for her that was the last resort and after trying ayahuasca it was like she was a completely different person. It was like someone clicked the reset button and she started to perceive life differently. And all of a sudden she loves life and she understands what she needs to do and her purpose and all that. And going into the experience itself is actually is a very long story, but I do understand what happens. And, and uh, we all need to understand the psychology or the biology behind what happens in the brain, you know, when you consume uh, such plants. because Ayahuasca is really high in a substance, a chemical substance called DMT. DMT is uh, short for dimethyltryptamine, and it's uh, baffled a lot of scientists and uh, neurologists and psychologists in in the past decades. There's a psychologist called uh, 
I'll, I'll get you the name of that psychologist, but I read his book and I first, like at first I didn't understand what was going on until I actually went through the experience. Cause a lot of people don't really believe that it cleanses to that extent. You know, it's uh, life changing. It's a profound experience basically. But what happens is that DMT is actually like it exists in our brains, you know, it, it exists in our brains ever since we were babies, you know, it actually start being produced by the embryo after 45 days of becoming an embryo in your mother's womb. And uh, a lot of scientists believe that it's start of like, this is how consciousness is introduced into the body after 45 days of becoming an embryo. And this, that's exact same time where gender is determined, which means that in order for you to magnify the DMT in your brain, it kind of teleports you to a different dimension where you see the truth. Like the veil is lifted, you know, when you go through that experience and you, you just go somewhere else. Now, what motivated you to go there? Why did you want to have this uh, soul searching? It's because you wanted a soul searching experience and that was a good one or what motivates you to go to Peru? So a lot of people actually advised me to try ayahuasca because of a phenomena called ego death. Mm -hmm. you get to experience the death of your ego. And uh, that exact, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened there. It's, uh, you get to go through different phases during... By the way, it's not a pleasant trip and it's not a high or it's far from happy trips or it's not like that at all. Is it on the hallucinogenic side, like shrooms, like magic no, no, no. Or is it stronger? I mean, how is that? Like it's The most powerful substance you can ever encounter you actually go through different stages and uh, the, the first stage is a life review you, you get to experience your whole life all over again and you go back you regress back to all your traumas so you basically regress to everything in your life that was holding you back and you relive it and at one point you get stuck you know and, and it just keeps rewinding until you know how to deal with it and from one situation to another and it's just like and it's a very painful experience because you don't just watch it but you relive it and, and uh, you relive the feelings and emotions and, and once you get past that it's gone it's lifted off your shoulders and it's like you're a new person and it's uh, crazy how it works because it knows no timeline and that's the thing it doesn't just go back to your conscious memories but it goes back to your subconscious memories some people get affected by their birth for example like if a baby gets trapped into their umbilical cord while they're born it, it gets to affect a lot of their personality when they grow older you know because a lot of that personal changes happens from the ages of zero to seven right dr d and a lot of people don't know what's going on with their lives during period of and period of their lives and what happened and what causes this change and it sends you back to this memory even if you were a baby and, and uh, you get to see everything that happened and you just get rid of it and that's just phase one so this is mainly recommended for individuals who are who are seeking the death of their ego or they're seeking some sort of a soul searching experience some sort of self understanding uh, or even to be able to understand something that happened during their developmental processes that might have interrupted and this is probably what also Freud says that a lot of times there's a lot of things that have happened to us that have been repressed and that's why the majority of what we do on a daily basis is really impacted by our conscience except that we don't really know what's impacted and what's been stored there that's what you're saying. And I guess what you're saying is that you had decided at one time that I want to unravel all my subconscious, unconscious experience. Where did I become a narcissist? Mm -hmm. So it all began with the question of like, am I really a narcissist? And if I am, how did that happen? And what can I do to get rid of it? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm saying. But that was my own experience. But not every single person go for the exact same right. reason. No, of course. Right, oh. but every single person have their own traumas and their own repressed emotions from the past, you know, and, and it translates into different psychological troubles, right? Some people go there because they have PTSD, some people go there because they have depression, some people go because they have insomnia, some people go there because they don't believe in God. And what's interesting that 
after the experience, we're kind of all in the same page. We all speak the same language. It's as if you're reborn, you know, and, and uh, that's what I found interesting. Dr. D, you should experiment with that. I'm moving. I'm moving, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to, I'm see moving to Peru I'd, soon. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to see Dr. D, Dr. D uh, like some like trippy stuff. See what happens to her. <laughs> I think I'm going to try it. I think I'm going to go to Peru and try to rebirth because I think there was a lot of screw up growing up. So, But you know what you were saying is that everyone in there you guys all had a common thing. You had a traumatic experience or some sort of a exploration that you wanted to do from the memories that were repressed. So you guys mm -hmm. all had something similar, except that your experiences are different, but that's what you're doing. You're trying to unravel what is keeping you depressed or behind or narcissist or anxious, suicidal. That's what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, to your point, we all have troubles. We all went through some mm -hmm. kind of traumatic experience, whether yeah. it was extreme or mild, you know, but we, yeah. we all, every single person went through some kind of trauma. And um, some of us don't realize that it can affect our personality, especially if we're repressing it. And mm -hmm. that's what we should not do. We should not repress our emotions after a traumatic experience because when that happens, you're not solving the problem. When that happens, you're actually changing and manipulating your personality into something way worse than could have been if you let out all these emotions somehow. And it's very important for you to be able to do so no matter how hard it is, because it is really hard. You know, it's very hard discussing or talking out loud about the worst things that happen to you. And uh, if you're not going to do that, it's just going to make things worse. It's as simple as that. And that's what we uh, learn over there. An interesting fact that I also learned there is in order for you to naturally increase DMT in your brain, it's uh, through meditation. And through, but of course, it's a much slower process. But if you seclude yourself or isolate yourself in a dark room in a quiet area for a regular period of time, the quantities of DMT in your brain increases. Hence, you get to slowly, without even realizing it, go through that self-reflection and self-realization and the shattering of all the traumas you've been through. It all happens naturally, but over a much longer period of time. And of course, if you see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, uh, they help you trigger these emotions so you, they can speed up the process. But yeah, it's all along the same lines. And the thing, you wanted to say something, Dr. D? Or? No, go ahead. Oh. Yeah. So the following phase after, like once you've dealt with, with all of that, the following phase is quite tricky because most people reach that level, but a lot of people have to go through a lot before reaching that stage. And that's uh, stage two in ayahuasca, the experience of ego death. And that has been the hardest part of the whole experience, even harder than what I've been through trying to solve all the and, and deal with all the trauma that I had. At that point, I really didn't know exactly what was meant by ego death. But a lot of the psychologists there and the shamans there, they were like, you have to let go. When, when you get to that stage, you have to let go. So I was like, I will let go. And when that happens, I'll probably let go. But I didn't know what to let go of, you know. <laughs> but when I got there, it was really hard to let go. <laughs> like, it, was, it was the definition of death. You know, you get to feel like you're going to die, basically. And it's not your mind playing games. You actually feel like you're going to die. And at that stage, at that point, you feel like you have an option of either letting go and dying. But if that happens, you, your brain really convinces you that you're going to die. So that's definitely not the option that you're going to choose, right? So you're going to choose option number two, which is regain your consciousness and wake up from the experience. But if you do that, you realize that you're still holding on to your ego self. You're understanding that we are separate from the universe. And the concept of death scares us so much that we hold on to dear life, you know, and we always choose to come back to life. So that what happened to me the first night, but the second night after a lot of talk with the psychologists and the shamans there, 
I went through the experience again. And when I reached that stage, I didn't have the option anymore because I have dealt with so much trauma and so much with my life and personality that when I reached that stage, it just happened naturally. And at that point, you just, you feel like your spirit is blasted out of your body and you just go somewhere else. You just go to a different dimension. You see a different reality. You communicate with some beings that try to explain the concept of reality and the concept of life. And it's so surreal. It's more real than the fact that we're talking right now, you know, and it's, you feel like you're going through, it's really hard to explain by the way, but you really feel like you're being teleported into another world, into another dimension. It's like you're going through this cosmic tunnel in the speed of light. And at the end of this tunnel, you reach a point where you feel like you accessed some kind of like a point of unified consciousness, a river of consciousness where everyone is the same. And all of a sudden, in a split of a second, you just view the world. You, you can literally see the world from the eyes of every single human being. And that happens for a split second. But it's like you understand the world because you literally see the world from the eyes of every single human being. And it's so frustrating because this moment slips away and um, and you just go back to where you were. When that happens, everything disintegrates, your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your identity. You stop knowing who you are. You don't remember who you are. You don't remember that you're a human being in a human body having a human experience. So, and it feels like eternity. So when I went back, like when I regained my consciousness, I was like a changed person. It was like a hundred years of psychotherapy in like a span of five or six hours. Wow, that's deep, dude. <laughs> like that's that's really deep. Now, Dr. D, here's a question I'm going to throw at you after listening to Ahmed. And I think this is, I always say it on this show, every show that I'm on is everybody's different. Everyone's individual. Can we as human beings experience something as enlightening as Ahmed experienced, but through different mediums? I mean, you know, for instance, my life-changing experience was the birth of my son. That's what really changed my life, I think, and completely transformed the way I look at life and the agreements that I set with myself and the approach that I took. And, you know, much like Ahmed, I think we've gotten great wisdom from shamans and from that side of the world, from Peru. I read a, a book by Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements, and that changed my life. That was like five years ago. So do you think we can experience that, but without the experience of external substances? Is that possible from a psychological perspective? Well, I mean, of course, maybe it won't be as deep as Ahmed is, is uh, describing. And as he said, like this is experience probably took care of six or seven years of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy. But obviously some people can't handle going that deep. And some people might ask you, and actually I was going to ask you that next is like, what's the advantage of doing that? I mean, everyone has their own term of what life experiencing episodes are. For me, it could be that, I mean, for let's just for now, people, this is, you know, COVID-19 being a quarantine, being um, in isolation where people have never been in isolation. I mean, we're in a viral war. That could be an eye opener for some people where they're setting up priorities and realizing that life is short and that maybe they need to do some self-reflection. I mean, for you is your son's birth. You know, I've had several times where I felt like really this gave me a different perspective of life. Does everyone goes in one, and there are people they're never going to go, they never want that life altering time because maybe they're not ready for that. Mm -hmm. Obviously what Ahmed is talking about is that, and anytime we talk about if it's drugs or if it's non-drug experiences like you've had, you know, those are always going to be a deeper, intense and I don't think that everyone is ready for that. You were describing it and I was thinking that maybe the people that get there, and I'm sure there were people with you that probably didn't realize the depth of this and maybe couldn't handle it. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I really want to know. You were ready because you've been ready to really do this soul searching, this sense of like identity, this sense of getting rid of my ego. There are people that say that, but when they get there, they're not really ready to let go of what they already know. Why? Mm-hmm. And, and as we know, people like don't like to change 
the things they know, even though the, what they know is bad. Do you think it was worth it going to this experience? I mean, why go through all of this? What benefit did you really get out of this? Not only this, but writing the book, going into that route, that path of the path of like, like you call it beyond the prison of belief. What, what did you get out of it? What I got out of it was more of a general understanding of every single person and where they stand in terms of their beliefs and how to respect their own beliefs and uh, respect my beliefs and eradicated the sense of judgment that I had about others. And it definitely helped me perceive the world from different lens. I don't perceive cultures and nations and divisions and, and all that the same anymore. Anything that leads to separation or division is going against what I believe in and what I saw. So there was like a sense of reprogramming, a reshuffle of what I have to do as opposed to what I was doing and for that experience. But now I have like a bigger sense of purpose and it has nothing to do with materialism, by the way. To your question, Mahdi, about, you know, whether we should go through something like that to experience this life-changing encounter, we don't really have to go through it. At the end of the day, it's something that is already within us. So whether you go through psychotherapy or you trigger that substance in your brain through these plant medicines or it happens naturally to people who go through near-death experience. As a matter of fact, it's the exact same processes as DMT, as, as ayahuasca. You know, the exact same chemical reactions happen in the brain when you go through a near-death experience. The exact same amounts of DMT is released by your brain. You know, this tunnel of light and you see you relive your past and you go through these experiences that change you. It's the exact same experiences. Uh, DMT is responsible for near-death experience, dying, and dream states. And they're all connected whether you take that medicine or you don't. We all go through it at different paces in life. You know, it's, and like Dr. D said, it's all about whether you're ready to go through it or not. Some people are not ready and some people are forced to go through it. What's going on now in regards to you know, the corona, it feels like there's self-corrective isolation you know, that forces people to face their shadow selves. And uh, this is not an option. No one has an option. No one has a say in this. And that's, that's why it's been like a very emotional ride for every single person. Some people are okay with it, but some people are panicking. Some people are facing their shadows and it's all happening all over again. And that's what I feel, you know? So to your question, no, you don't need to take such substances to, for this self-realization to happen, but it definitely helps if you're ready for it. If you're ready to go through it, you're going to attract it to yourself. There's a reason why we're having this conversation today, right? And you yourself might be ready for it. You may not be ready, but the fact that we're discussing this today and you're hearing this now may mean something. And because there's a lot of people looking for purpose, and especially in therapy, I see a lot of people, they're lost. They think they want this, they want this, but they don't really have a purpose. And maybe this purpose was never in existence from the beginning. When you grow up in families that don't really have any, maybe structure or routine, or they don't teach you to have a purpose, if you're overly spoiled and they do everything for you, you're not going to have a purpose. Or if you're underspoiled and been punished, you're not going to have a purpose either. So I think it has a lot to do. So people are looking for purpose. What do you, I mean, before we end, what kind of advice can you give to people that are, maybe they don't, they can't, or they're not ready to go to that extreme like you've gone. Your extreme was because you wanted to do some changes for yourself, but you also wanted to write it in a book that would make sense to other people. But what, what advice can you give to individuals who are trying to find a purpose? Why, what should they do? What can they do right now as a beginning steps? Okay. Actually, right, right before this whole COVID-19 isolation, self-distancing happened, I used to say that to a lot of people that asked me that exact same question you just did. It's through the process of elimination. It's through isolation. <clears throat> will lead you to your purpose. You need to sit with yourself and try to ask yourself, what would you do if you did not have the job you had today? And like without factoring in money, what would you do that makes you feel passionate about life? And that's exactly what you should be doing. 
because money will come as a byproduct of what you're doing. But a lot of people are just too scared to abandon what they're having. And it's hard. I understand it's really hard, especially if you have like a family. But that question is really important for you to be aware at least where you should be headed. Whether you're going to take that action now or later in your life, you really need to ask yourself that question. That's deep, yeah. dude. That's some deep shit. Where was all that stuff when you were bringing in math exams back in the day, dude? <laughs> 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 like, 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 Ahmed back in the day, he was the dude that everyone knew. Like, he brought in all the exams and it was like, <laughs> where was all this? Like, we used to have conversations and talk, but never this deep, dude. Like, shit. <laughs> this has gone down a whole different lane, you know? Last time I saw you was at the Battle of the East. Yeah, the CrossFit competition. The CrossFit competition uh, a year ago. And you weren't there this year. I was actually thrown down on the floor this year for the, with the old guys, man. So <laughs> I heard, yeah, I heard. yeah, dude. I didn't I heard do you I, killed it. I didn't do I heard that you bad. Killed it. Yeah, you killed it. First event. I mean, who would have known I was a swimmer? I came out in third in that event. I think I shocked. The <laughs> <of that. laughs> but then it kind of tapered off after, you know. So once I saw ring muscle ups and I was doing singles, I was like, shit. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> but like, dude, I mean, back in the day, it was soccer, and you know, we—I never knew that you had this much of a deep understanding of life, and the road would point you in this direction. You know what I mean? So it's awesome to see where you're at, buddy, and it, it's really uplifting, and it's admirable to see what you have done with your life and the perspectives that you've looked at, and everything dude and honestly thank you for coming on and shedding light especially on ayahuasca and that stuff like that's something that i hope i never have to try <laughs> to figure life out <laughs> maybe i can convince my dad into doing it because he's a bit of a narcissist <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit yeah a little, a little, a little bit and i, I didn't want to say anything but have you guys noticed anything about my right arm through this whole podcast you know it's not you're not moving it what happened Oh, no, I've been moving it. It's just I've been doing. T oh, there, and there's S. a patch. Oh, yeah. I'm, what do you have? I'm electrocuting myself. I've been doing it the whole podcast. Why? It's basically like cupping. So it adds blood flow. So. Wow. This is what old age does to you. Wow. I know, he knows what I'm talking about. Cross, <laughs> crossfitters try everything. This dude's tried ayahuasca. All right. You can't really. I can't top that. So <laughs> I had to throw that yeah. up. Oh my God. I was trying I'm... to screw with you guys by like not telling you. And so you're like, what the hell's wrong with that guy's arm? But yeah. <laughs> I am the most boring out of the two of you. I have never done drugs. I don't do any of this. Oh my God. How did I even get to become well, a podcast? Hold on. I've never done drugs either. Well, I mean, <laughs> never done ayahuasca. That's for sure. Ayahuasca. But you know, it sounds like a, a, a maybe. That. You know, there's always going to be a time in our life where we really want to get. And I feel like it might not be a bad idea for people that are ready because it is a life altering experience. And it gives you and like you said, I mean, maybe not only for you, somebody that was struggling like you, but as you said, somebody that's depressed or people that there. I mean, there are a lot of patients have tried so many different methods of treatment and it doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's an experience that you felt or at least the group that you were with also have benefited. And I hope that the benefit, you know, lasts because sometimes you go to these like these groups or these uh, treatment uh, uh, centers, whatever. And the idea is that a lot of times things are good, but then when you leave, and even if you've gone through stage one or two, because you go back to the same environment, you go back to the same toxic people. Mm -hmm. You don't do the cleaning up, like you said. So and, true. Yeah. So you go back to the same thing, and so. You, you really have to be ready because what that means is that any centers like this, any health center, wellness center, you have to make sure that you come back to make some changes in your life or it's not going to work. This is critical, actually. It's critical because otherwise you'll just find yourself falling into the same cycle. Well, good. It was so great seeing you, Ahmed. I'm so glad. Yeah, same but here. Same so here, doctor. Psychology classes have advanced you and helped you to reflect yeah. by the way i got all a's in your classes so <laughs> that was the start I, uh, that was the beginning that's because yes. she was an easy professor <laughs> <laughs> she, she, was, she was not she, i'm joking i'm joking she was not <laughs> i know dude, i know it's I not earned, my reputation i earned it man no 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 you did no but uh, both of you you guys were very interested very analytical you wanted to learn 
And then after the minor left, some people just taking it as electives. I was always a BC student in your class. <laughs> I wasn't much for exams. <laughs> <laughs> Exams are not for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. they yeah. weren't for me. You know, I didn't take, I didn't get a good grade in my classes because mm-hmm. the exams weren't for me. But we got to give them. You know, what can we do? Well, thank you, Ahmed, so much. Good luck to you. Thanks, buddy. Take care of yourself. Be safe there in Qatar. Yeah, you too. And it was great seeing you. I mean, I not in person, but it's been a while. It's been like twelve years now, doctor, yeah. since, since I've last seen you. So yeah. it was great seeing you. And thank you very much for hosting me. And good luck on your life, actually. You're doing really well. Good Thank luck. Thank you. Thank you. And once Go in to get a over, PhD. You got to get a PhD in psychology. I, I'm actually going to talk to you about this once I'll all give of this you a recommendation and... letter. Yes. All I right. Will. Thank you so Definitely. much. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks, <Great. Ahmed. laughs> Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening, guys. You too. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Kuwait. Thank you, and join us next time.